Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. At 20 minutes before 8 central time, Professor Farrell of the Mount Jennings Observatory, Chicago, Illinois, reports observing several explosions of incandescent gas occurring at regular intervals on the planet Mars. The spectroscope indicates the gas to be hydrogen and moving toward the Earth with enormous velocity. Professor Pearson of the observatory at Princeton confirms Farrell's observation and describes the phenomenon as, quote, like a jet of blue flame shot from a gun, unquote. We now return you to the music of Ramon Raquello playing for you in the Meridian Room of the Park Plaza Hotel situated in downtown New York. In 1938, families across America tuned in to their radios would suddenly be stricken with horror as to their surprise they would be informed that America was now ground zero for an alien invasion. This radio broadcast would later be revealed to be none other than War of the Worlds by Orson Welles. This radio drama fooled thousands and at its time was revolutionary. War of the Worlds was, truly, the first deceptive use of analog technology in order to fool and unsettle its listeners, making it the first example of analog horror. For those of you who don't know, analog horror is a subgenre of found footage horror, which relies heavily upon the analog technology and often cameras in order to give the film you are watching a decaying and broken effect to scare you even more. On top of this, found footage is often able to fool its viewers to some degree and to put them in the first person perspective to make them feel more like what they are watching is actually real life. Nothing captures this quite like 1999's The Blair Witch Project, which, during its time within the early internet, was actually able to fool the majority of the internet into believing that this small student project was actually real-life footage proof of the existence of witches in America. I personally am quite passionate about analog horror because my father has always been a huge horror fan. When I was younger, my first horror movie was the original Halloween, followed by Alien vs. Predator. And those movies changed my childhood and kind of sucked me in. <laughs> My first exposure to analog horror, however, was actually completely unintentional. When I was a kid, we had a VHS set, and we would often watch movies on it. One of the TV shows that I actually had on VHS to watch was the original Sailor Moon. Sailor Moon was a favorite of one of my older siblings, and at the time, I grew up on it, so I actually quite enjoyed it. However, it was an old VHS and VHS's decay. So when the VHS was scratched and broken and Sailor Moon started aggressively spasming and deteriorating before my eyes on the screen, that was an interesting experience. <laughs> However, until recently, analog horror has been pretty niche. It doesn't really get a lot of attention on the big screen. The one singular big screen example of analog horror that I often think of is Cloverfield, because I'm a huge Godzilla nerd, and I mean, my YouTube's channel name is literally named after one of the most niche Godzilla monsters out there, so. But as I was saying, the most popular big screen example that I can think of would be 2008's Cloverfield, which, for those of you who might not know, is a kaiju film in which the analog horror monster is a giant kaiju destroying a city. But if analog horror is so niche, then how come on YouTube, pretty much every single person who uses this platform has heard of analog horror? And as time goes on, more and more and more people become more affiliated with this genre. So what causes the boom? Well, YouTube itself most likely had the biggest impact of all time on 
the horror industry in terms of what genre is popular as of right now, considering I don't think any genre is more popular than analog horror right now. On August 8th, 2014, and some of you might immediately recognize that date, a game that, you know, you might have heard of, Five Nights at Freddy's, was released and would soon be covered on newly formed YouTubers. Oh, oh as one of the most, if not the most, popular horror games of all time. I would like to argue it is thanks to that that analog horror finally got its foothold. Not only did the game's success promote YouTubers on the forum, which allowed YouTube to explode, the entire series of Five Nights at Freddy's games revolve around analog camera systems. Keyword, analog. This overall explosion of the popularity of horror on YouTube and of gaming on YouTube would completely change the way the horror genre is viewed, at least within popular culture. The film industry itself hasn't really cared. I don't think people making movies are realizing how much of a gold mine this stuff is especially in the recent five nights at freddy's movie it was played off more as a the whole family can watch this film and you know not actually be that scared by it and that was a mistake on youtube individuals who lack money any sort of budget any sort of professional filmmaking setup are able to freely promote their work and create analog horror stories that are consumed by millions and gain their own popular fandom, which then expands rather aggressively. The vast majority of these fandoms are extremely familiar, considering they're quite like how the Five Nights at Freddy's fandom expanded. For an example, music based upon horror has actually become extremely popular in recent years, allowing musicians to find their own creative path. And a lot of these songs are inspired specifically by analog horror. Why did that happen? Because of Five Nights at Freddy's. A lot of the popularity of the game not only came from YouTubers and its coverage, but also of fan music. Here's an example of one of my personal favorites. And these songs spread like wildfire. I mean, they're good, so rightfully so. Several fan games created from the series rely on found footage, and even if you still doubt me, I would like to point out the popularity of fan-made analog horror on YouTube. That is literally Five Nights at Freddy's. Some of my personal favorite analog horror series that I have watched a few too many times my sleep schedule regrets it, include, of course, the classic Mandela catalog, the one that everyone now knows about, the back rooms, The aforementioned Five Nights at Freddy's Baddington tapes. Jacob? It's time to go home, baby bird. The oldest view. What? <laughs> A recent Godzilla inspired The Man in the Suit. Vita Carnus. Ah! 
The Greylock Tapes. Another FNAF inspired The Walton Files. There. And the most recent, most popular analog horror example, the boiled one phenomenon. And by the way, if you wanted a little more proof of the popularity of horror-inspired music right now, here's an example of another song based upon The Walton Files. There are a lot of flaws with YouTube, especially in the past couple of years, with monetization and with ad revenue arguments and all sorts of issues that every single content creator has covered. But YouTube is a platform that we should all be extraordinarily grateful for, that I think a lot of us take for granted in a lot of ways. YouTube is currently opening the doors to the next generation of filmmaking for all genres, but especially low-budget horror and low-budget comedy. Analog horror has always been a thing, and as niche as it has been, but thanks to YouTube, it has experienced the strongest rebirth and reforming that I have ever witnessed within a genre. And moving forward in the upcoming years of the film industry, I cannot wait to see a large film industry take on something like the back rooms and just haunt us to our core with liminal spaces overall i am i'm a sucker for analog horror i really am it's been a part of my life for a long time now and who knows maybe i'll take a crack at it myself